Great. Um, I think we are just about ready to get started. Uh, some more folks will probably trickle in as they um, wrangle with the Zoom platform and figure out how that works. Um, but we'll just give it a go. Uh, thank you all so much for joining our second webinar in the Upside series on peer support in the Global South and in non-Anglophone countries. We had a really wonderful webinar yesterday with Jasmine Kala from Quality Rights Gujarat to talk about peer support in India. Um, and today is all about peer support in Sub-Saharan Africa and specifically in East Africa. Um, so we're going to have some really cool speakers today. Uh, we'll cover a couple of different topics. Um, so I'm just going to take us through a rundown of how to use uh, the Zoom platform as a participant, just in case you guys have any questions. Uh, and then Dave Bailey and Eddie and Karununji, who've been working for uh, quite a while together on the Brain Gain projects, are going to talk about peer support in terms of its international context and also um, personal experiences of delivering peer support. Um, We'll have a couple minutes for questions, and then Dr. Juliet Naku and Dr. Richard Mpongo from the Budibika National Referral Hospital in Uganda will tell us a little bit more about the Brain Game projects, but also about the upcoming um, Upsides trial, which is just about to begin to generate uh, more rigorous evidence on peer support in low, middle, and high income countries, including the two countries that are um, presenting in today's webinar. Um, after another short break for questions, uh, Dr. Faluka from the Muhumbili University of Health and Allied Sciences in Tanzania is going to talk about um, this really exciting transition Tanzania is in right now from uh, moving from or adapting an existing model for peer support for HIV uh, to mental health. Then we'll have some final questions and a closing, but um, if we do have a lot of questions, we can stay on a little bit after, uh, after the hour, just so that everybody gets a chance to ask. Um, just a couple of tips on how to use Zoom. Um, first, this is a public webinar and it's going to be recorded and posted to the Mental Health Innovation Network website and to the Upsides websites. So um, while we definitely encourage candid conversation, uh, we just want you to be aware. <laughs> um, we're going to keep everybody on mute um, so that you don't end up with the situation you're probably hearing right now where I have a phone in the background. <laughs> um, uh, so we'll keep everybody on mute and um, we will unmute you when you want to speak or ask a question. So the way to do that, you have two options. First, you can use the participants panel. Um, it might appear on the bottom or the top of your screen uh, to give us some kind of sign. You'll see a couple of different buttons there like um, a, a green button, a red button, a, a thumbs up, a thumbs down, a hand wave, any of those things. If if you click them, then we'll know that you want to ask a question and we can unmute you. Um, alternatively, if you don't want to deal with muting and unmuting, you can just type your questions directly into the comments panel. You'll see um, a chat. Uh, it's a little speech bubble either at the bottom or the top of your window. And if you use that, then you can type in any questions directly. And you're welcome to do that even while um, the presenters are speaking so that we have a nice bank of questions lined up for them when they're done. So I think that is it for me uh, and just want to say thank you and please do stay in touch with us on Upsides and the Mental Health Innovation Network. We're going to be live tweeting today some of the um, really exciting uh, conversations that we're having during this webinar. Um, and again, it'll be recorded. So if you have any colleagues who missed it and uh, want to hear later, you'll be able to send the link to them shortly. Um, with that, I think I'm going to hand over to um, Dave and Eddie. Just give us a second while we switch over our slides. Thank you. Hi, Dave and Eddie. Slides look good. Yeah, you should be ready to go. Are we able to hear you? Good. Uh, can you see my slides and can you hear me okay? Yeah. Good. Okay. So uh, my name's Dave Bailey uh, and I'm going to give you a, a brief talk with Eddie and Kurunungi who will talk after me. I'm a psychiatrist working in East London and I've been involved in setting up the Batabiku East London link that has run over the past 15 years 
and involved in uh, the Brain Game projects was really an attempt to bring peaceful work into uh, statutory services in Uganda. Um, and in the course of this brief talk, I'll briefly mention some research, but Eddie and I will mainly focus on our own experiences of peer support work. And I really want to emphasize the, uh, the mutual learning from peer support work in Uganda and East London, and how both peer support work services have learned from each other and influenced each other and benefited from this uh, collaboration. Um, I can just get on to my next slide. So, uh, peer support work uh, is defined as mutual support provided by people with similar life experiences as they move through difficult situations. So, in a mental health context, this is people who have lived experience of mental health problems supporting other people uh, who have mental health problems. And there's a number of reasons that peer support work is considered to be helpful. Uh, it may be that peer support workers and peers may be better able to relate to each other, given the similarity of their experiences, the kind of I've been there factor. It may be the change in the relationship between peer support workers and their um, mental health problems and services, and the move from being a passive recipient of care to be an expert who uses the knowledge and wisdom that they have gained through their experiences to help others. There's this issue of mutuality, the principle that both people can gain from a supportive relationship, and that's very explicit in peer support work. And there's also the potential for better understanding, acceptance, and, and empathy. So if we briefly touch on the evidence, uh, the early studies attempted to show that peer support work had clear, hard clinical outcomes. So increased time in the community after discharge or reduced bed days in hospital. Um, but a meta-analysis of some of the early uh, evidence was less clear-cut, and there were methodological uh, limitations. Um, so the, the, a lot of the studies were quite small, they were doing peer support work in different ways, and they were analysing different outcomes, and so it was quite hard to aggregate these studies together. And then there was a lot of research showing that peer support work can impact on much more uh, recovery outcomes, such as improved social and work functioning, reduced stigma, empowerment, uh, feelings of being listened to and understood and, and a sense of hope. And so really the idea that peer support work may offer an improved quality of, of services. Um, and then in 2018, there was a study in The Lancet that showed that people who received peer support work at discharge were less likely to be readmitted. And for those of us who are trying to make a business and ethical case for the development of peer support worker services, this was a really exciting and powerful addition to the evidence base. So, um, peer working has been going on in our uh, hospital, our trust in East London for over 10 years. Um, and about 10 years ago, the way it worked was that peer support workers were trained and would work with one peer at discharge from hospital. Um, and so we have had a uh, link between East London uh, Foundation Trust and Butterbeek Hospital over the past 15 years. In 2008, uh, three staff and three service users came to Butterbeek Hospital, led by Cedric Hall on what was called the Heart Sounds Trip. Uh, and the idea was to promote the idea of service user leadership. And we met uh, many inspiring service users who were very passionate about the idea of uh, improving services. And out of that, there was the development of the Heart Sounds community-based organization, which was a service user group who provided informal peer support work. This then developed into the brain game projects that we worked on between East London and Butabika, uh, which were very much to try and develop the idea of peer support work in statutory services. So in brain game one, peer support workers were trained and along with the community recovery team from Butabika Hospital, developed a model of community peer support work for peers discharged from the hospital. In brain game two, this was upscaled. Peer support work came onto the wards and into seven of the 13 regions around Uganda. There was a recovery listening event that led to the development of a recovery college at the Butabika Hospital uh, and attempts to uh, evaluate the impact uh, um, much better. And then brain gain impact, which is really trying to make peer working sustainable by embedding it into routine services. So we had train the trainer, uh, engagement with Ministry of Health, uh, development of manuals, uh, education recovery films, uh, further evaluation. And given that we had a large number of peer support workers working in Uganda now, we wanted to rescue the learning uh, through uh, community of practice workshops. 
And so some of the themes that came out of that was that there were clear benefits to the peer support workers themselves, uh, but also an impact on the peers and the staff and the system that they were working with. And it really gave the idea that this way of peer working could be an exemplar, not just in East Africa, but also in the wider world. Um, and it's our feeling that um, peer support work can provide quite an elegant solution for a number of systemic challenges for mental health services in a low uh, income setting. Uh, so it can provide a solution for difficulties with human resources, follow up in the community, issues around uh, stigma and very institutional attitudes, uh, moving away from diagnosis to a more recovery orientated intervention and moving from doing to to doing with uh, uh, with our, our service users. So um, I worked alongside the peer support workers and the community recovery team for a couple of years and when I returned to East London I joined a community recovery team there and I found our staff there very burnt out, very stressed, very lacking in therapeutic optimism and uh, I reflected that it was basically missing the kind of heart of peer support work within our teams and so we were able to score some pilot funding uh, to address this using uh, principles that we learned from the peer support working that we've done in Uganda. We felt there needed to be a large number of peer support workers in one team. They needed to be central to the team, embedded within team. We needed to be very inclusive about recruitment. The main criterion being that people want to get involved and they're quite passionate and believe in the model. Uh, the aim was for every service user um, to be able to benefit from peer support work uh, and to be very explicit, the benefits are for peers um, but also for the team and most importantly for the peer support workers themselves. So the peer support work should be a, uh, seen as part of a, a routine recovery uh, pathway and, and really moving from thinking about ourselves as health professionals who support patients with mental health difficulties to start thinking of ourselves uh, having to focus on trying to uh, support people who've got uh, mental who've been through mental health difficulties to use that knowledge and wisdom that they've gained to think about how we can support them to use that to help others so where we are um, now in in Newham for the past two years the task has really been to embed peer support work into services and to be as valued as as any other professional group within the team so we have a number of peer support workers working within our community and our inpatient teams, supervision is embedded as is client, uh, clinical line management. We're trying to develop peer support work into other specialties and also to develop career progression. And through this learning that we've had uh, through Uganda and East London, we can see quite similar benefits and challenges across uh, both settings. And these are issues around threats to power of an empowered service user group, issues around boundaries, gender issues, um, challenges of relapse and, and end of work on financial security, which is why it's so important that we afford peer support workers the same employment rights, sickness protection and financial security that we do other members of our teams and embed them into our system. So I'm going to hand over now to Eddie, who's going to tell you a little bit about what peer support work is from his own experiences. Thank you, Dev. Can you hear me loud? Yeah. Um, to give an account of my experience in peer support working, particularly from a user perspective, right from Uganda to London and back to Uganda. My first contact with medical services was at Budavika National Referral Hospital, where I am right now stationed in the Recovery College. And by the time I was a student at the National College of Business Studies in Akawa, which is currently called MOOBS as Makere University Business School. Uh, it was a difficult, challenging time. I was pursuing the student leadership in the student skills, and campaigns were so strenuous, and so it trained on me. I left my room, went to my girlfriend's room, which trained on her. She asked me to leave. Eventually, I went to an uncle's place where I barricaded myself in a house. And later on, I was taken to a police station and brought to the medical hospital, where I received treatment by first being put in seclusion for some time. Shortly after that, I went back to school and completed, but then something happened. My mom passed away, and thereafter, I moved to England to join my siblings with the hope of finding a better life. But the better life turned out to be around time, and I found the life of so strenuous at make ends meet. I couldn't find a formal job. I, I did many jobs, and they strained on me within about weeks. I found myself in hospital back again in, in England, and uh, the mission. Stay for two weeks and I was discharged. But later on, 
the stress stresses were continued and uh, at, at one point I got in trouble with the police and found myself in hospital for a long time. That was the situation setting in East London. And uh, at that time I got in touch with services and uh, we started finding a way of gaining user service user involvement. And uh, we did some research work with the city university and also meetings with the service users on the ward. But primarily we had a big meeting at the trusted quarters at a place called East One, where we would meet monthly with the clinicians and the policy makers and the service users as a way of informing change and supporting change in to better the services provided by trust at the time. And around that time, the Island and Trust were turning into a foundation. So there was need to have a service user voice on the boards of the of the trust. So a, a Eklon started building up for service user involvement and uh, that way it started to inform the way change would happen in service user involvement and eventually led to peer support movement. The group was known as the Working Together Group Meeting and that informed the way of service user involvement in the UK but also in Uganda in that at one point when we started peer working in Uganda the hard sound venture came about and uh, it informed our work in Uganda on peer support working. Later on, I returned to Uganda and I got involved with the hard sound, sound group. This was a very exciting group. My return to Uganda was an aftershock because a lot had happened. Most of my friends had moved on. Some had got married. I, got, I started a new life. So hard sound was a fallback position to give me a social life and background of new life and new friends who valued me for what I am and uh, took me as a buddy and did not stigmatize me or look at me as some weirdo or any other outcast, but embraced me as a friend and someone who valued us. I did work as a project finance, uh, finance, finance administrator at Atsons. Next slide, Dev. Next slide. Can I move the slides? Okay, so from London, from Uganda to London and back, I did peer working in the Brain Game project. This was a groundbreaking project of peer support working with a grant from DFID. And uh, it was uh, first in the writing, we thought we would do peer support with the awards of Butavika, but let's have a peer support workers were not worth enough to do work on the awards, and it was put in the community. The Brain Game project was implemented by the Heart Sound group. And uh, this was service user group, which was a very good innovation, uh, in enriching to the service users, giving them a voice and uh, empowerment. Uh, people got skills in administration, project management, project planning, uh, proposal writing, and uh, that informed a lot of work that we did. And so many other groups sprang up learning from the Hassan group. And uh, later on, we, the group, the implementation was successful that it enabled the, the, the project to win another further grant of 25,000 United British pounds, which turns out to be about 1 billion Uganda shillings, to build, a, to set up a recovery college at the Utabika Hospital and do peer support in the world of Utabika and seven other regions within Uganda. The Brain Gain project was also very successful and has been sustained by the hospital taking on at about five pressure port workers to work in the recovery college and uh, also to inform, it informed the writing of other projects. And later on we did the Brain Gain Impact. This was the icing on the sugar and uh, this informed the drawing of the manuals that were or peer support training manuals and recovery college manuals were, were written in the brain gain impact. And also there was an evaluation of the recovery college in that, in that component of evaluating the recovery college in the brain gain impact. So benefits and challenges. Benefits are quite many because uh, they stretch from me getting direct contact with Ministry of Health, having contact with hospital managers, the hospital directors, having international partners like the Sheffield Social Care Trust, uh, we had a great partner who does our bidding marketing in the UK, Dr. Professor Richard Polish, and uh, 
from the College of St. Rose. He grew that he partners in that in Australia, Diana Hardy with the Recovery College in, of Australia, and Marion Farkas in Boston University. So the benefits also include the upside project itself, which was informed by the implementation of the Brain Gain project, which is a consortium of over six countries in about seven study centers. Research I've been able to partake in research and also publish in, in big, 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 big publishers like the BMC Psychiatry, the Lancet, and also, but most of all, it enabled me to challenge stigma because I don't feel shy to talk about myself and I feel proud. I feel proud to share my story with the, anyone all over the world. And uh, stigma, challenge stigma is, is, is very important and key to me. Because because of stigma, many people shy away from treatment and they don't they deteriorate so far. So the group has informed the upside project, but also the peer nation group, peer nation service user group, which is a, a service user initiative of doing peer support with the community centers around Kampala. And just yesterday, the director of the Dark Hospital signed a memorandum of understanding with the Peer Nation group. So at the moment, the Peer Nation is a partner of the hospital. And so service users have been given a rebirth and growing on to do to be independently in the community as an establishment. Uh, the, the Brain Gen project was award winning, like it won the JHC award. And uh, I also realized some international travel I went to Dar es Salaam and uh, we have links with people in Rwanda and hope to make other links in, in Tanzania. So that's my journey with Peer Support from Uganda to London and back to Uganda. It's been an interesting journey, a wrong turn somewhere, and a good turn somewhere, but on the whole, it's been a, an enriching experience. And I wouldn't like any service user to share away from sharing this story or going on to do Peer Support work with any group in any setting. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Eddie. That was really wonderful. It's so great to hear, to have these wonderful voices able to really bridge the perspectives of kind of peer support in an international context and what it means in Uganda, and also um, with just this incredible personal experience. Um, I think we have about five minutes-ish for some initial questions. Um, I don't think we have any written into the chat, but just as a reminder, um, if you don't want to uh, ask questions verbally, you're very welcome to type them into um, the chat box. Or if you'd like to ask a question, uh, we can unmute you, but we need you to give us some kind of sign in the participant panel that you want to speak so that we know to unmute you. Great, so there's a question um, about to Eddie and Dave about, uh, can we hear more about the challenges, particularly around threats to power, boundaries, and gender roles? Um, Eddie, do you want to take that and then maybe Dave? I think challenges are that uh, when you're working with a big establishment like Dabik Hospital and a modest or marginalized group like services, is, there must be power dynamics. At one time, we had a proposal to write a, a, pro, a project of quality rights, quality rights like the, the, the quality rights in Gujarati, but uh, it was frustrated because it was challenging in a way because we were thinking of challenging the orthodox. So in a way, it didn't happen, but um, you know, in, in some way, you need to be very compliant and uh, very, very, very down to earth in order to work with the big establishment like uh, type hospital, particularly if you're a marginalized group. But on the, on the other hand, they have been welcoming. Uh, they have been welcoming because they brought us on board and we are able to talk at uh, on round tables with them in a way. Like I'm saying, we just trying to remember of understanding with them. But challenges can be cannot be out ruled out. Thank you. Thanks, Eddie. That's a really insightful um, summary of some of the issues. I don't know, Dave, if there's anything you want to add to that? Just a couple of points, really. I guess the issue around the gender roles was, I guess, um, th there will always be problems in any system that, I guess, reflect wider difficulties in society. And so uh, some of the kind of 
uh, sexist or misogynistic attitudes that you might see uh, anywhere in society uh, could be present within a peer support work project. And so when we saw elements of that, we took uh, steps to uh, raise that and quite explicitly explore that within the, the, the team uh, working and then uh, bring out a kind of protocol of what was expected for people and did some training around that as well. In terms of the safeguards, again, it's it's interesting. I think when you bring peer support work into an institution for the first time, when there are problems, so if there are issues around boundaries or uh, inappropriate relationships, then clearly you could seize on that as evidence that peer support working is not working and that it was inevitable that it would not work. And I think it's important that we have the humility as <laughs> to realize that those problems will always occur in institutions, whether you're talking about a psychiatric hospital, whether you're talking about uh, police or religious institutions or schools. And so you need to be aware of the possibility of that and uh, develop safeguards so that you are looking for that, not catastrophize when it happens, but deal with it appropriately and expect that it will happen because it will happen in any uh, any uh, project that you have or any uh, institution that you have. So you just need to be alert to those potential risks, really. Great, thank you so much both. I think we, we might have time for one more question. Um, otherwise, we can move on to the second presentation and um, if anything comes up, we can uh, chat about it in the next break. There's a question there from Hannah. Uh, from, uh, great. So how, if at all, was the model of peer support adapted to the local culture and beliefs in Uganda? Um, I, I could maybe uh, give a couple of points to that, and I don't know if Eddie wants to add. I mean, I think it, there's always a criticism of uh, cross-collaboration, that you might be bringing uh, mental health ideas that maybe are relevant in one particular setting if you collaborate in another, another setting and how translatable those are. For me, one of the real benefits of peer support work is that you are, you are empowering people to use their own experiences to help others. So I think the fact that you are supporting peer support, uh, people with lived experience of mental health problems to support others they are using their own language and understanding and uh, models around that. Obviously, it took place uh, in Uganda in a hospital setting, and so there was sometimes a tendency to emphasize the, the, the role of diagnosis and medication, and I guess we tried to help people reflect on that uh, a little bit. I think the second thing to say when we did our recovery listening events, uh, we tried to explore what recovery meant to Ugandan setting rather than a Western setting, a uh, high income setting where maybe a lot of re uh, research around recovery has been done. And the two differences that really came out was one around uh, a greater emphasis on uh, spirituality and the importance of spiritual spirituality in recovery. But the other one, I think, was a more collectivistic approach to the understanding of recovery. So it was really important for people not just to get well themselves, but to use their wellness to advocate for better services for others. And I think that was something for us um, that, that peer support work was much more kind of like an activist and advocating type of peer support work that we might see in a more than you might see in a more individualistic society like in Britain. So that was for me those were things that uh, emerged in the way that it evolved in a different way. I don't know if you've got anything to add to that, Eddie? Uh, peer support in Uganda has a long history with the HIV group. When we started the Bengen project, we had to benchmark from the HIV group, that is the TASO group. We, we, they've sent us on uh, pilot visits to some peer support models elsewhere. But primarily what was more striking was the peer support of the HIV group which was very successful and uh, it is similar to that of, of mental health in that both have a component of stigma, challenging stigma. So it was not something new that was happening. It had happened before, although in a different context. So we benchmarked from that and we hope to take it further from this. If at all it would succeed and uh, government takes it on, on a whole role, like they've done with the HIV group, which is now the TASO group is now taken on by government and, and streamlined within the system. That could be successful. We hope the government could think of uh, taking on peer support seriously and having it in health centers. 
and also having it as uh, uh, on the organogram of the of the of the of the hospital, the Ministry of Health policy having the peer support role. So it had happened elsewhere, and we all benchmark from it. And so it, it is not so it's not an alien thing here because we both what we call the Nuno Mukabi, that is the body group you may think of, where you share a problem with your with your friends in a way that you relate to each other, and it's a form of peer support in one way or another. So it wasn't something very alien to us, if I may say. It was something that was happening, although in an informal way, but we have tried to, to make it formal and uh, streamline it. We hope it will be adopted by the government. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eddie. It's really interesting that you've raised this point about uh, the relationship with, um, with efforts to involve uh, service users in HIV in a more proactive way, because I think that's what Dr. Faluka is going to be talking to us about a little bit later. Um, in order to get to her presentation, though, I think we also need to move on with our agenda for the day. So, um, uh, Dr. Richard and Dr. Naku, are you ready for your presentation? Great. Um, so Dr. Richard and Dr. Naku are going to be speaking to us a little bit more about uh, the context in Uganda, but also about what's coming next. So we've heard about the several years long um, effort to really embed peer support in mental health care in Uganda. Um, and Dr. Naku, I think, is also going to talk to us about uh, what sort of the future and what steps do we need to take in terms of the generation of evidence in order to really make the case to policymakers that this should be uh, an integral part of the health system permanently. Hi, Grace. Hi, how are you guys? Fine, Hi, thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Great, they're this muted, but I'm sure they're all greeting you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, um, this is Dr. Juliet Naku. I'm a psychiatrist working at Butabika Hospital. I'm also the principal investigator for Upsides in Uganda. You're all very welcome. I'm here with Dr. Richard, who will speak to you at some point as we go along. Wonderful. Are you having any trouble sharing your slides with us? Because if so, we can um, we can project them from here. Are you not seeing them? I don't think we are. Are you able to share your screen with us? Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Great, can you see us now, Grace? Yes, you're good to go. We're talking about UPSIDES. UPSIDES stands for Using Peer Support in Developing Empowering Mental Health Services. And this is a project, a consortium, that's running in different sites, including Ulm University in Germany, Hamburg University in Germany, Nottingham in the UK, Beersheba in Israel, Gujarat in India, Utabika National Referral Hospital, where we are sitting right now, in Uganda, and Ifakara Hospital in Tanzania. That is who we are. The main aims of Upsides are to replicate and scale up peer support interventions for people with severe mental illness, and also to generate evidence of sustainable best practice in high, middle, and low resource settings. Dave has ably talked about peer support, as many of us understand it. He has also talked about the results that have been done previously to show how useful Peer support is in some settings, including improvement in psychiatric symptoms, which in some places has, result, has resulted in decreased hospitalization, larger social support networks, and enhanced self-esteem and social functioning. It's a key concept in recovery, especially in mental health, and may work for any condition in mental health. Members meet, 
on an equal basis and support each other in a reciprocal manner. Peer support in Uganda has been here before, and I would like to hand over to Dr. Richard Mpango to give you a little bit of what has been happening in Uganda, and maybe to add to what Dave has already um, presented, Dave and Eddie. Richard. Thank you. I'm very sorry, Dr. Richard, we can't really hear you. You might want to come closer to the computer. Um, and also, I'm afraid that the slides appear to be frozen. Um, I'm going to hand over the screen to Oneza uh, so that she can manage the slides for you, but you just let her know when you want her to change the slide. Okay. Okay, could I go back to my slide of the history? Dr. Richard, we, we still can't hear you. Is this the one that you want? Hello. Yeah, oh, I need to. Yeah, okay. Can I follow this one? Oh dear. Okay, peer support uh, has existed in Uganda, and there are some studies demonstrate that it's been. I'm so sorry, Dr. Richard. It's, it's just very, very faint. I don't know if you're able to come next to the computer to speak because um, I think where you're sitting now, the computer isn't picking it up. Yes, peer support in Uganda has been practiced in other, other areas like, uh, do you hear me? Do you hear me? Yes, yeah, we hear you now. Yes, very well. Thank you so much. Yes, yeah. Like uh, we've had other studies which demonstrate that there has been some peer support for Ugandan adults with uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, a study by Linda et al. had to demonstrate that was possible to use peer support as an intervention among uh, with type diabetes. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah. Yeah. Similarly, we've had uh, the slide is not moving. Okay. Is it is this, this one? Yeah, yeah. Peer support in mental health was demonstrated in Brain Gain One, and uh, it was possible to train service users in Uganda. Uh, possible to get service users to work alongside the mental health professionals, and the CRT provides support in the community. So we, we had to use uh, a tool, evaluate and measure risk outcomes. So benefits were quantitative, difficult to show at that time during brain gain one, but uh, qualitatively, we had to demonstrate that it was possible to have improved recovery, uh, support, a sense of purpose, recovery, and reduce stigma. Next slide. But uh, in brain gain too, we had to upscale the work of brain gain one and understand and document the concepts of recovery, uh, starting the listening stories to develop the themes that guided uh, our work during brain gain two. And we had to develop films we had developed films that would uh, demonstrate recovery and psych education, bringing peer support work into the hospital wards and evaluate uh, how this would work. Starting from the ward, moving to the community, and we had to move to other regions, uh, other seven regions, demonstrate that it's possible to do intervention with peer support work. So that, that initial work led us to develop the Ugandan context of recovery, and that would help uh, us to, to measure and gauge recovery in the Ugandan context. So we had uh, specific themes that would guide our work, and these came from the listening stories. Some of the themes were relating self-expression, health lifestyle, support relationships, 
support, financial stability, holistic services, acceptance, challenging stigma, positive experience of spirituality. So these were the Ugandan uh, themes relating to recovery, and these were helpful in helping us to provide a platform for the uh, recovery and recovery college as well. Next slide. Yeah, uh, that's one of the slides demonstrated the sharing stories uh, where the themes were developed that had to guide the, the work uh, for recovery in Uganda. Next slide. Yeah, I've already talked about that slide. Those themes had to guide the recovery work. Now creating the recovery resources, one, one of the main outputs of uh, brain gain too and uh, through the recovering stories you had to develop the themes then you had to develop the training manuals peer support work manual recovery manual and these have become living documents some of these have been adapted to be used by the upsides next slide and the recovery college is in existence so the early results uh, by april 2015 2016 have indicated that uh, there was uh, an impact of this uh, uh, brain gain. So you can, I think, look at the numbers. And the, we had to involve 36 males, 28 females, uh, thus 64 together. And these were followed up. And we had to demonstrate that it's possible to undertake and do some recovery work. Next slide. Yeah, so early indicators of effect had to consider the before and after the referrals, and there was a mean difference of uh, minus 0.74. So there was a mean difference uh, in the, you know, number of inpatient days, uh, days that were, you know, enjoyed outside the hospital. And were, initially, we had to focus on the frequent relapses, people who are frequently relapsing for over three three times within the calendar year. So we had to modify that at some point, but uh, that would help us to gauge the, gauge the effect. So uh, next slide. Yeah, so that leads us to the upside. I'll uh, to take over from the network of uh, brain gain one and brain gain. Thank you. Can you still hear us, Grace? Yes, we can. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Naku, is there anything else you wanted to add about upsides moving forward? Yes, but I'd like to change the slides that you have, please. Great. Which slide would you like? Let me just share them with you. Great. In the meantime, while everyone is um, waiting to see the new slide set, um, are there any questions that folks would like to talk about? Um, I know there was a comment earlier from Benjamin about the experience of Liberia, where he says peers are under the yoke of stigma, which makes it difficult to live in a society unfriendly to people with mental health conditions. So the only source of support is peer support. I don't know. Um, Eddie, if you kind of feel, if you, if you want to comment on that or if you feel like that um, right. is sort of relevant to the early experiences of developing peer support in Uganda with this really pervasive stigma that you commented on. Talking of stigma, that is something that, that Savish has experienced universally, globally, wherever you may be, whichever context you may be, be it a low-income country like Uganda or high-income country like the UK or any other part like the US, stigma is faced all over the world equally anywhere. It's not specified for a local setting or Liberia or anywhere. 
it is faced by all people in uh, all services as wherever they may be they face stigma they face isolation they face discrimination and marginalization the only way you can face stigma is to f to hold it by the horns and face it front on and uh, we need heroes to come up and uh, fight this going forward because uh, if we will keep it under the carpet and don't talk about it it will just bite and kill us silently but uh, we have to come up strongly boldly and fight the stigma like any other person you you can't you you, you need to find a way of winning battles without actually fighting you should may say but uh, stigma is something that happens everywhere and uh, we can't we, 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 there's no magic bullet on how to fight it in one way or another, but uh, you, you've got to be you've got to be very bold to 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 challenge stigma, if I may say. <laughs> very, very wise words. Um, great. It looks like Dr. Naku, are you also ready to um, continue with your presentation? Do you have my slides already? Yeah. Um... Is, I, I believe you were on the objectives slide. Is this right? The next steps. Slide 14, please. Okay. Can you see mine, Grace? I'm talking about the next steps. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that we see your screen. Can you share your screen, Dr. Naku? Okay, I think yes. because we are going to run out of time, um, why don't we also just take this other question that came up, which was um, for more details on how to make peer support E. So is there a planned online or social media intervention? Um, I don't know, Dr. Naku, if you want to take that or if you'd like me to address it while you're um, working on getting your slides coordinated with Oneza. You guys can communicate about this uh, in the chat box if that's helpful. All right, I'm, I'm gonna take this question if you don't mind um, while you and Oneza kind, uh, work on the slides just to get coordinated. Um, so for the question on making peer support more of an e-intervention, um, there were plans to uh, actually have the training component for upsides um, be an e-intervention. So the entire training would be available in uh, modules that could be accessed online. And this would have ultimately helped to make um, peer support training more standardized across the intervention sites but kind of thinking more about the feasibility of doing that in low middle and high income country settings with different levels of computer literacy different levels of um, access to internet uh, different resources available it it hasn't actually materialized we ended up really um, going back to uh, fairly basic face-to-face -face training and while there are hopes in the future for more rec replicability of the training to make it available online for the purposes of our trial it actually just didn't prove to be um, really feasible which I think is an important lesson for us when we're thinking about trying to scale up and replicate e-based interventions across um, really different resourced settings um, because peer support workers themselves are oftentimes not folks who have access to a computer or who um, have higher level education uh, on how to on computer literacy um, in some of these lower resource settings especially so it's something to be quite aware of um, moving forward but there are obviously particularly from high income countries um, there's a lot of push to move more towards e-interventions because uh, they're seen as more cost effective and easier to replicate um, all right are you ready Richard and Naku mm -hmm. Are you seeing the, the slides now with next steps? Yes. Okay. So the next steps uh, are upsides building on to the, the 
are the gains of brain gain, one, two, and impact. By doing more work to study the effect of peer support on individuals and organizations. Our objectives as upsides are to contextualize and adapt peer support models uh, for those sites where there are no peer support models, to establish an international community of practice for peer support in high, low, and income settings, and to conduct a situation analysis of existing peer support initiatives in the participating countries to scale up peer support where pilot initiatives already exist. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, Dr. Juliet, I think you are, you're controlling your slides. Well, I think they are freezing. Other objectives include to test new interventions where there are no peer support initiatives and to rigorously evaluate inputs, processes, and outcomes of implementation. This is the step that's not been done by previous peer support interventions. And this is the value that upsides will add to this body of work. We'll also distill from case studies evidence of best practice for dissemination to local, national, and international stakeholders. There we go. In phase one upsides, which has already ended in June 2019, we had some achievements. We identified feasible key features and culturally adapted components of peer support interventions and training programs. We drafted treatment adaptations for each site and adjusted preliminary adaptations. We developed flexible, ready to use peer service manuals and materials and developed an, an internet-based peer support training platform. Phase two is where we are and we are going to do a multi-center pragmatic parallel group randomized controlled trial. In this, we shall evaluate the outcomes of delivering peer support for service users, for peer support workers, and for organizations. We will evaluate the processes of implementation of upsides peer support intervention with special attention to differences in contexts across study sites between Europe and Africa and Asia. We'll assess the value for money, for peer support for persons with severe mental illness. And this is particularly important in low income settings uh, where human resource is very low. Our outcomes will include social inclusion as our main outcome. And the secondary outcomes will be empowerment, hope, recovery, health, and social functioning. And these are going to be measured objectively. We'll also measure cost effectiveness and um, study the process. What do we expect to achieve? By the end of upsides, we shall have evaluated a peer support intervention for people with severe mental illness across low and high income countries. We shall have explored the essential components necessary to create a peer support model in mental health care, especially in low income countries like Uganda. We'll also have created an evidence base for universal and local elements of, of intervention. In conclusion, Upsites is positioned to provide the much needed knowledge regarding the impact of peer support on people with severe mental illness in low and middle income countries, as well as on peer support implementation and cost. Such information is the missing link in any future effort to scale up peer support in high, low and middle income countries. Thank you all for listening. This is Upsides. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Naku, that was wonderful. Um, 
just because we are starting to run a little bit behind on time, can I ask Dr. Feluca if you're able to start changing over your slides? Um, uh, we'll hand over the um, capacity to do that to you. Uh, and in the meantime, there's a lot of questions on our chat. Um, so one of these uh, from Kieran was whether peer support networks are associated with biomedical mental health care facilities and how do you ensure that those who seek all types of mental health care treatment can be included in the peer support network. Um, so in particular, she's looking for any tips on how to make the peer support network inclusive and respectful of all views about mental health. And I, I imagine that's pointing to both biomedical and other kinds of perspectives on mental health. Um, would somebody from the Uganda team like to take that question? Oh, yeah. uh, my suggestion, of course, Sorry, Dr. Richard, would you mind coming very close to the computer? Yeah, uh, my suggestions would be to embed peer support and peer support models into the normal, or normal schedules, normal oh. organizational structures and work alongside the existing uh, institutions that are offering biomedical services to see focus on the integration because here uh, from our experiences and challenges gone through it's integration that can help us to address the challenges around this place so uh, peer support has to ride alongside the existing biomedical practices in institutions so that it can be nurtured until it's able to establish itself independently away from the institution that offer biomedical services. So for now, what worked for us was to ride alongside the existing structures and systems. And even in sustainability, we think about uh, embedding peer support into the government structures that are catered for. Great. Thanks, Dr. Richard. So I think some of the key points of that are, yes, under upsides, um, peer support is mainly linked to mental health care facilities. And that's partially because um, it is a randomized control trial. And uh, that's the easiest way to recruit from um, a fairly similar pool of people. Uh, I'm aware that um, some of the participating sites also give peer support in different formats, not just in uh, healthcare facilities, but as Dr. Richard's pointing out, um, it's really important as well to integrate peer support into the existing mental health care system. And in particularly uh, in a lot of the in a lot of African countries, mental health care is heavily centralized and focused on um, institutional care. So uh, introducing peer support workers into the mental health care system does to a certain extent mean um, introducing peer support workers into facilities. Uh, and Dave and Eddie's points from earlier were about some of the challenges of doing that and respecting different power hierarchies. Um, even in the context of a, a me very medically focused mental health care system that sometimes has quite differing views on mental health from more of a recovery model that we see in some higher income countries. Um, great. Uh, Dr. Fluka and the team in Tanzania, are you ready or would you like us to take another question? Uh, we are ready. Great. Well, really excited to hear about the experience in Tanzania. Can, can, can you see, I've tried to share the screen. Can you see it? Uh, nope. Okay. Oh, we can, we um, can't see your slides. We, we can see your screen, but we can't see your slides yet. Would, would you be able to move over to the PowerPoint presentation? What about yep. now? Yeah, perfect. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, um, Hello, everyone. Hello, Dr. Fuluka. Yes, yeah. I'm Dr. Fuluka from um, MUHAS and um, Ipakara Health Institute uh, in Tanzania. And uh, we're going to discuss about uh, adapting the uh, peer support in HIV um, to peer support in mental health. Uh, we are discussing this because this peer support in mental health is, is something new to us. Um, but it's not ex like because of the, for, for, in the general population, but in HIV population, 
we already introduced uh, peer support dealing with mental health issues in people living with HIV. So um, we are going to discuss this and see um, how we are going to introduce our, this peer support in our in a, in a general population in mental health uh, population. So. In the background, the peer support system in Tanzania, as um, it was introduced few a uh, few years after ART started in Tanzania, and um, it's between 2000 and 2010, and the main reason we introduced were um, to promote HIV AIDS awareness and prevention, and also promote HIV testing in the community, and improve support uh, support network, uh, as well as uh, facilitate adherence and retention to care. And this was introduced to supplement the home-based care system, which was um, run by the um, healthcare providers and uh, overall healthcare services in HIV AIDS discipline. Because uh, it was overwhelming for them. And um, as as we go on, and we know the sub-Saharan African is a pandemic area for HIV, and the number of uh, people who are enrolled into care were increasing. And although the um, the um, human resource was not uh, at at par, so it, it was. Um, this was trying to also uh, supplement using community healthcare providers to um, to be able to help the healthcare providers in providing care with HIV and meeting the target, um, which was um, um, put on by the WHO. So, the adaptation approach framework uh, for. Um, what they are using for peer support. We have different models of peer support, um, dealing with uh, support, uh, social support, dealing with uh, uh, follow-up, uh, uh, loss to follow-up care, and also even uh, um, supporting uh, severely ill patients who are HIV positive, and also in the TB cases and, and, and so forth. So this ADAPT ITT model was um, designed um, in, in any case, we, if you want to introduce uh, peer support, uh, peer support um, um, services. And it was um, uh, published in 2008. And um, this, it has several phases on how we introduce and it is based on evidence-based intervention that's where um, uh, available in that time. So it, it starts with the assessment um, which involves uh, 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 um, focus, uh, focus discussion, group discussions, um, elicitation interviews, and the need assessment with the target population. So here we assess about we, we assess on the and the especially the need assessment what uh, the population the target population needs, and then after that you make a decision and reviewing the evidence base according to the, the, the need from the target population, what they want. And then we you, um, you do a reviews and um, see what are the best intervention, evidence-based intervention available for, for such um, uh, services. And then you make a decision and select uh, for the new target, and then you um, start adapting, either adapting or adopting. And then the first three is adaptation, um, where you're using a theater testing. And the theater testing is, it can be uh, media, through group sessions, through um, even community, uh, using uh, community, uh, stakeholders and all that. And then with that it helps you to modify such an intervention and then produce it in phase four and then do a topical experts and see if it is um, feasible. And then you integrate between the two, phase, phase four and phase five, in the phase six, and then start doing the training. And, um, and the training is involved even recruitment. And the recruitment it is more specific what you really want to recruit. And then later on, you do the testing, the pilot testing for that. And, and most of the, of the intervention that we um, there are several uh, peer support intervention in, in, the, in the country. I'm going to talk about the two interventions which involve the mental health or behavioral or psychosocial issues. So um, for Namweza intervention, which is um, was it's a project um, run between 2010 to 2014, 
and uh, this intervention is the um, it, um, Namweza, the meaning of Namweza was is the yes, together we can. Uh, it's a Swahili word, and um, it's, it's, a, it's the intervention focuses in preventing HIV and um, HIV and promoting sexual and productive health and rights um, by addressing underlying factors relating to vulnerability of um, acquiring HIV, such as um, depression, intimate partner violence, and stigma. So um, with this, it, it has this, um, several theories and framework. For example, the first one was appreciative inquiry framework, which is helped to identify and acknowledging individuals' ability to build empathy, group cohesion and self-awareness as well as self-esteem. And then um, using circular questioning, this was um, helping them to be able to identify problems, the, um, individual problems, even the um, community problems, what they have. And then another theory was dreaming and backlighting, which this one was useful to provide action of planning because when you dream about your future, you, you think about your goals, what you want in, in five years to come, and then you backlighting on the first day or today, what you want to do so that you can achieve the, uh, what you wish to, to become in the, uh, in the five years. Um, and then effective uh, communication and assertiveness. This used to, um, the use of I statement in, emot in emotion, emotive situation. And um, with this is like when you are, more emotional and if you want to react towards uh, um, this is more of interpersonal relationship and um, if you use the i statement it may bring you down and not to go too further to um, to create uh, quarrels and, and also you can even make yourself feel more less emotional and also feel some other uh, other person around you less emotional as well and my mapping is is, help, is useful for learning about hiv about the knowledge and, um, and even places where to go to get the support. And even the social learning theory was used as well during this uh, NAMWESA intervention. So step for adoption of this NAMWESA project. Actually, this project was also um, um, uh, uh, done in, in Uganda as well in here in, in Tanzania. And they, um, so the first step were to uh, intervention package uh, to fit the cultural relevance. So even here, they follow the first phase of the, um, the framework. Um, so they did um, focus group discussion, key informat um, interviews, IDIs were done uh, for key population and other stakeholders. And then identification of potential peer facilitators here. The key features where we, we want to, uh, they wanted to identify a potential peer facilitator where high interpersonal collaboration, like the sense of humor, and uh, also being optimistic and, um, and with the respect. So if, if you find someone with that quality and who are HIV positive and are in, um, in a care, uh, so um, they were more eligible to get into it so that they can um, facilitate those group sessions. So the mode of delivery of these interventions were the group theater, of a 10 session and the group theater tested exactly like the phase three. So what they did there here, the, um, they do the session and after the session is uh, there were a series of evaluation from, um, from, the, uh, uh, from the, the users and also from the facilitators to see whether there's some difficulties or any, any challenges they are facing during that session. And then later on the, um, the uh, evaluation and there were a series of uh, support supervision feedback from both uh, facilitators and participants after each, each session. So this is um, the NAMWESA project. And the NAMWESA project had a very uh, positive outcome in the community. And, um, and actually, it, it resulted to several um, community-based organizations, which they, um, for example, one of it is uh, Kimara Peers, which they do um, uh, provide the peer support and actually some of the um, uh, international non-government uh, non NGO, non-government organization, they've taken up this um, package and um, start to, to um, 
to um, scaling up to other regions as well. And this was done only in Dar es Salaam. Right now, several regions have already um, um, adopted this um, intervention. And it has improved remarkably the self-esteem and self-efficacy um, of, of, of the individual who are living with HIV, reduced the rate of depression, and also stigma were minimized by, because of, uh, of this project. Uh, so moving to the health option study, this is was target, uh, targeting depression among uh, pregnant women, perinatal women who are living with HIV. It, and it, the study uh, was in between 2015 to 2018. And uh, this it was a, as a result of NAMWESA. And um, because of the, um, the rate of depression um, among these pregnant women were very high. For example, in, in Dar es Salaam, generally, uh, in HIV care, ten, ten, uh, um, almost 10.5 percent to 45 percent uh, had the mild depression. People living with HIV in rural and urban, urban setting, and the rates are higher in urban compared to rural setting. So, um, and also in Tanzania, um, almost 40, 43 percent of in, in urban pregnant women were living with um, with um, with uh, living with uh, with HIV had depression. Um, so. This was introduced to actually reduce the rate of depression among perinatal women who are living with HIV. And uh, they follow the same um, 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 theories and framework with, uh, from Namweza. They adopted it. So they're using, uh, they were using also peer support. But these peer supports were only mothers who were already passed through the PMTCT. And, um, and the Namweza, uh, um, was adopted the problem solving therapy and those it was a group therapy and started with uh, almost uh, seven seven six sessions and um, and this was before delivery and then after delivery they get this uh, if the, uh, um, the individual still with the depression they, they uh, get into the cognitive behavioral therapy that they adopted from the thinking healthy of that WHO thinking healthy um, um, intervention and um, so those are the sessions what they um, they had through and and also um, was also for, for, for CVT as well so the recruitment of and training of the community-based healthcare workers which these are lay counselors the way we recruited them is it's similar to like in the, in the Namweza uh, project and it's, um, but they need to be identified by the PMTCT point person at the study clinics. And the criteria for consideration of uh, uh, peer support were the peer mothers that they previously attended in PMTCT services, who are HIV positive, completed at least primary education, and the literate and then have a knowledge of HIV. In addition to that, they, um, we, we did uh, assess them, their sense of humor, and respect and optimism, um, and then having the knowledge of HIV was where in a in a high um, opportunity to, to get involved into into this. And the training was involved the um, the peers to walk through the the whole pro program and also experience the curricula themselves. So the the health option um, project where because we involved the, the mothers who are not uh, depressed, but they were going to uh, facilitate the group session as intervention, the mothers who are depressed. But, but during the training, um, we had a two week period of um, script training. And during that time, we also um, find some majority of them had experience previously or even uh, at the, at, during the, start, the, the training they had uh, at least some depressive symptoms. So with that training made them feel more um, understanding about depression and also get more aware of, of it and how they can uh, um, easily um, um, get um, better. So um, with the health option, um, because it is, we disseminated it uh, during, uh, in 2018, and um, we currently um, 
but the preliminary results showed the rate of depression was went, went down uh, by almost 70% and also improved even the, um, the child outcome. Um, uh, and also we reduced even the number of, um, of even pediatric uh, children who are HIV, uh, who are test tested positive after the delivery, after they receiving these interventions. Um, thank you. Uh, so with, with this, what we see, um, if this peer support has shown some positive, uh, given positive outcome, even in, this, in the population, um, of, uh, in a HIV, uh, people living with HIV, what we, we are more excited to see even uh, um, very positive outcome in, in, in people living with uh, mental illness as well. So, and, it, and I feel that it will be very feasible and even preliminary, we, we did the focus group discussion with uh, healthcare providers at the psychiatric department of two hospitals and um, they really, um, the need for, for peer supporters in mental health services is well, um, very, um, it's needed. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dr. Feluca. Um, I think this, there's some really important points there that harken back to what Eddie said and what some other folks on the chat have been saying, which is um, that there's this incredible tradition of advocacy and also innovation in HIV care in East Africa, especially. And um, it's created this sort of platform or this baseline on which uh, peer support for mental health care can also build. And, and that's really exciting that you guys in particular at your site are harnessing that expertise in order to make that possible um, as part of the Upsides project. Um, I'm afraid we've gone slightly over time, but we don't need to close the webinar just yet. Um, so if the presenters are able to stay on the line, maybe we can work through some of the questions that have appeared on the chat box. But if anybody does need to go, please do feel free. We know this um, is a busy time for everyone. Oh. Great. Um, so there was a question earlier about uh, when we're talking about peer support um, in this context, are we talking about people with lived experience and are there any other qualifications to be a peer support worker? Um, I wonder if that might be a good question for Dave to answer if you're still there. Um, because you can sort of talk about the uh, different ways that people define peer support um, in the literature and in different countries. Uh, yeah, happy to respond to that. I put something in the, uh, the, the, the group chat line, but absolutely to be a peer support worker, you need to have had lived experience of mental health uh, problems. Um, one thing that we had a couple of times on our training was carers or well-wishers wanting to come along in the training and the way that we our concern about that was that often the voice of experience is disempowered and uh, I guess professional perspectives and quite often family and carer perspectives are given more value in day-to-day uh, -day, in the normal stigma of everyday life and so it's very important I think in the training that the uh, service user voice and the voice of experience is given pri uh, primacy. So I think if you were going to have carers involved in training, I would have one or two there alongside 25 people with lived experience or so, so that you, you know, you really, the, the voice of experience comes out. That's for me, uh, the really important part of the, the training is that we shift from uh, people uh, all of us involved in uh, the support of people with mental health problems, thinking about uh, people suffering from mental health problems. Clearly, mental health problems are, um, you know, cause great distress, and you wouldn't wish them on anybody. But uh, for people to start um, valuing the knowledge and the wisdom and the experiences they've got from that, and the learning that they have got from that, and think about how they can share that with others. Um, so for me, that is really the core thing. And I think sometimes there is a tendency to select, um, in inverted commas, good patients or patients who particularly agree with the you know, predominant biomedical model of the, the, the institution. But for me, having 
uh, a multiplicity of voices uh, and uh, attitudes reflects real life and is likely to, to make any initiative uh, more effective. I think if you're able to tolerate different approaches in there. So for me, the most important things are people being passionate about the idea, wanting to do it and, and really getting it, getting the idea that uh, there is something that they have and they would like to use their experiences to help others. And to me, that is the, you know, the single most important criteria. Um, okay, I'll hand back to you, Grace. Thanks. Um, does anyone else want to comment on that, on what you think are the characteristics of a peer support worker? Because this is something we encounter a lot. Um, for example, I've, I've seen literature reviews on peer support in global mental health, and then you, you read through the descriptions of um, the peer providers, uh, and they're not actually always defined by their lived experience. For example, in maternal mental health care, it will be, you know, a, um, a recent mother who is considered a peer of a mother who um, may be experiencing uh, maternal depression. But the peer provider themselves doesn't actually need to have experience of, of maternal depression. Um, it's something interesting that I've at least seen in the literature, and I, I guess I'm wondering if any of the other presenters have uh, comments about how we define peer support um, in this particular context might actually be a good question for Eddie as well if you think there are characteristics that a peer support worker in a mental health care context really needs to have. Thank you Grace. Uh, it is key that one must have a lived experience but there's more to it than just having a lived experience. I think there needs to be an element of acceptance. Acceptance of your condition and also having the desire to share your story and to, to share your story with others to inspire and inform change in other people. So real experience, key, key component, but also acceptance because there's a tendency of going through transition from when you get first of all a mental challenge. It's like an accident. You need to believe, you need to grow through it. And then you, you you crawl, you walk, and eventually run and fly around like any other bird. And after that, once you've accepted your condition, you are willing to share it with others to inspire and inform change in their lives. That's what I would say would be the key ingredients of a good peer support worker. Great. Thank you so much, Eddie. I, I think there's also um, some comments here about group versus individual peer support. And I wonder if that might be a really good question for Dr. Faluka and the team in Tanzania, who I believe um, you guys have been considering whether uh, at the Tanzania site you're going to be delivering group or individual peer support work. What are, what are some of the considerations you've been talking about? Um, so oh, um, what what I've seen in in um, in HIV um, group session because it takes more people, and um, when you realize you, if you have a problem, there are other people. When in a group session, it means that you you can um, feel comfortable to share your things as as you see other people also have their problems, and um, but also individual is also. Um, um, also uh, useful uh, because it's it's something that some other people can be more open when they're in one-to-one -one session so whether group or individual is also it's, it's it, I don't see there's a marked difference um, in in a approach of uh, but group it, it takes people and also it improves this that network of um, of um, of of that of that of that that population so that they can they know they're not alone they know they can do more even they can also start their own organization and help supporting other people as well and improve that social network but and also in an individual is something that you can be more aware and improve um, understanding and because of the um, it depend on uh, even the mental illness that they they are suffering from. Yeah. Exactly. Grace. Yeah, definitely. I can see Dr. Richard has also been messaging um, me individually some responses about his, his thoughts about individual versus uh, group format. So I wonder, Dr. Richard, if, if you would mind uh, sharing some of those with the group. 
Oh yes, uh, uh, both are equally good. Uh, group based peer support and in group peer support, both are equally good. We've tried out both, but uh, I realize that uh, group based peer support helps to create a platform for recovery and helps people to share out and normalize the challenges and they feel like, okay, I'm not alone. It's possible to recover. They build on each other's, uh, you know, strength and move together. But uh, individual peer support uh, helps to meet the individual challenges the person may go through, the unique experiences that may not easily be shared within a group setting. Uh, actually, Oh goodness, I'm afraid, um, I'm afraid Dr. Richard has been cut off. Uh, da, 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 da. But he has written uh, in an individual message that I can read out that individual peer support helps to address individual challenges and enhances recovery, but it is quite expensive to sustain um, and reaching out to help many service users is a challenge. So uh, there's a real point about the replicability and the scalability, the sustainability, all those big words that <laughs> we need to keep in mind when we start talking to funders and policymakers and, and the key people who can help us to um, continue peer support work in our countries. Um, they may favor a group-based uh, intervention over an individual intervention uh, because it's, it's just less intensive to implement um, resource-wise. Uh, I think there are a few other questions um, that we can go through, uh, but I also wanted to give some of the folks who are on the line a chance to actually speak if they would like. I know Benjamin has been um, speaking a little bit on the chat about his experiences in Liberia. Um, folks have been talking about trying to start their own peer support programs in Ghana and South Africa. Um, and if you would like the chance to talk about that a little bit, um, do feel free to use the participants panel. Give us a sign that you'd like to speak and we're happy to unmute you because we'd love to meet you and hear about the things that you're considering as well. Um, in the meantime, uh, there was a question on ways to coordinate with the Global Mental Health Peer Support Network and their international community of practice on peer support. Uh, and Eleni, I think that uh, this is the initiative that um, uh, Charlene Sunkel is leading, correct? Um, I believe that they're actually already in touch with the Upsides team and have been discussing how to coordinate across these different sites and collaborate a little bit more actively. So that's really exciting. Um, and maybe one way that we can carry forward some of these conversations on peer support uh, in future. Would anybody else like to take the mic for a minute? Kieran, it looks like you're unmuted. Would you like to say something? No, okay, we're all very shy. <laughs> um, I think we can probably go on for about two more minutes, but then we're gonna be quite far over and we're gonna have to close. Um, are there any other questions that are burning that you'd like addressed before we draw this to, a, to an end? <laughs> Sorry, Karen. All right, I think with that we might, um, draw this to a close. Great. Uh, Laura, it's wonderful that you're connecting with Annalise and others. Um, what we'll do is, uh, I think we'll tweet from the Upsides Twitter where you might have heard about this webinar, um, a little form where you can add your email. I know a couple of folks already filled out the form to register their interest in the webinar. Um, but if you do want to connect, that might be an easy way for us to get in touch. Great. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of interest within the group about connecting with one another. So why don't we do that? Um, in the meantime, uh, do please keep following us on social media um, and feel free to direct message us if you have any specific questions um, or if you'd like us to direct you to one of the speakers from today who you have a particular question for or who you wanna connect with. Um, and thank you all so much for joining. It's really exciting to see people taking a whole, you know, hour and a half out of their day to talk about this topic that we're all so passionate about and that's really an exciting emerging area in mental health care in low and middle income countries. So thank you so much. <laughs>